Hey there, Vinny here, and this is the first in a short series of videos about the game The Vulgario Loquencia Deluxe Edition. In this video, I'm going to show you the setup, then I'm going to teach you how to play and solve the main rules questions. And in the next video, I'm going to comment on this new version, talk about the differences, and give my opinion about the game itself. In the video description on YouTube, there's a little chapter selection, if you will, so that you can check specific rules. Before starting setup, take a look at the number of components in the rulebook to see if you have any missing parts, but also to check if you have any extra components. Specifically, if you have extra cubes, keep them in a safe place, not to lose them, and because you will make sure the setup will be correct, and it will be faster for five players. If you got extra discs, though, there's no need to remove any. Another observation is that there are some components that I consider unnecessary. I have removed them from my game box, but don't worry because I'll teach you how to use them if you want to do so. Those are the round marker, which is the purple cylinder, and all the five merchant tiles. The first thing is to remove all the coins from the cloth bag. You may already give each player 10 Ducati. I'm simulating a game with two players. I'm pretending there's a player sitting there. And another one here. Next, take the cubes. If you already removed any extra cubes and you're playing with five players, all cubes are used. In case you're playing with fewer than five, you need to use a table that will show you how many cubes to remove. You may look at page three of the rulebook, or you may use a reference file that I uploaded to BGG. With two players, we use three politician cubes, five noblemen cubes, 14 abbesses, and six scribes. The remaining cubes may return to the box. You need to have in mind the number of cubes per round, which is the number of players plus two. Since I'm simulating a two-player game, there will be four cubes per round. Take all the cubes you set aside and put them in the bag to shuffle them. Now you need to fill these spaces from left to right, taking random cubes and respecting the limit of cubes per round. If you didn't mess anything up, you'll be able to fill spaces from one to seven. Now, locate event tile 10 and place it on space 10. Take the 10 remaining regular event tiles. I'm calling them regular to differentiate them from the five papal events. The ones I'm calling regular are the colored ones with text. And you need to shuffle them to pick one at random. Place it on space number one. Then reveal all the others and position them in ascending order, starting from the number you picked. So you're going to continue on space number two. Event 10 was already used. So firstly, it is ignored when placing the events on spaces 9 and 11. So if event 1 would go here, event 2 would go there. And since event 10 was used, from event 9, you go to 11. 11 is the highest number, so from 11, you go to event 1. 5, 6, 7, ignore event 10, and continue counting 8. Then take the 5 papal events and shuffle them. What I like doing is shuffling them under the table and passing them to another player who will do the same. That way, no one knows the order. Once they are shuffled, place them without revealing them on the five final spots. Next, the five Franciscan City styles. Randomize them somehow, place them on the five small squares, and review them. Go ahead and place somewhere on the table the five friar tiles and the five cardinal tiles. At this moment, I like taking one of the purple discs and placing it next to Cardinal Murray. On to the manuscripts. First, take the level 8 manuscript and set it aside for now. Then, separate manuscripts by level. As you're doing that, you don't have to form piles yet, like I already did. If you have five players, no manuscript needs to be removed. With fewer, you need to remove a certain number. You may check page 3 of the rulebook or my file. If you're playing with four, you need to remove one manuscript of each color, there are five total, from level 2. If you're playing with three, in addition to removing those, you need to remove one of each color from level one. If you're playing with two, 
In addition to removing 5 from level 2 and 5 from level 1, you also need to remove one of each color from level 3. The removed manuscripts may go back to the box. After removing manuscripts, organize them in piles and shuffle those separately. Take the manuscript board, take the level 1 pile and place it on the one cost spot, and so on. The rulebook simply tells you to leave the level 8 manuscript to the side of the board, but the ideal position is below the manuscript board. Just like there is a number of cubes per round, there is a number of manuscripts per round according to the number of players. Page 3, my file, your call. Review that number for each level on the manuscript board. The number with two players is 2. One thing that I always like to do when I'm teaching a game is to ignore a rule, an action, for the first round or first two rounds. In De Vulgari Eloquencia, there's so much going on that, aside from doing that, I remove an action for the whole match. That would be the Papal Library. Do that if you wish. Either way, preparation for this action would be shuffling the 10 library tiles and placing them on the corresponding place on the main board. Take the first event tile, the one you picked at random, and place it in the correct city. At this point, you would use the round marker, putting it here, replacing the event tile. Each player picks a color, give a player all the discs of his or her color, plus the three meeples of that color. You would also give them a random merchant tile, the ones that I find useless. Randomize the order of every player. Take a disc from the first player and place it on the leftmost space on the player order track, followed by the other players in the order randomized. In reverse order, ask each player to take a disc of their color, place it on the first spot on the knowledge track, and choose a starting city. Starting cities are those that have a name written on them, but that don't have a color. More than one player can't pick the same starting city. But, throughout the game, multiple players can occupy the same city. It was Red Player's turn to pick his starting city, so they take the Merchant Meeple and put them in a city such as this one. Then, it'd be Black's turn to do the same, so they take a disc, put them on top of existing discs forming a pile, and place their Merchant in a starting city. Give each player a shield. Money is always revealed. Behind the shields is where tiles and cubes go. Right now, you may hand out player aids. I only use a single player aid and on this side so I can check the phases of the round. Lastly, take the five action discs and give them to the first player. The game is ready to begin. Now, I'll teach you how to play. In this game, you are a merchant and in a general way, you're trying to have more influence and power than the other players. Initially, you're only trading, but you can also join the clergy and you can even become the next pope. The context in which players are is late Middle Ages Italy, and there, multiple dialects were spoken. We can see them represented by the five colors in the map. Those popular dialects, those vulgar languages, were gaining force, whereas Latin, which was the big language of culture, was losing power. That drew attention from merchants because that meant better contracts, for instance. And, of course, that attracted a lot of interest from the church, which wanted to get closer to the people by speaking their language. So, it became vital for both groups to study those popular languages. The winner is the player with the most victory points and every point is scored only in the end. All the ways to score are very well put behind the shield. I will already explain the main way to score. It's this white box on top. This is the election. Players have the opportunity to obtain a certain title, which corresponds to a number of points. The title of banker corresponds to six points, up to the title of pope, if you are a cardinal. This is worth 22 points. To get these points, you need votes. Votes are represented by brown, dark blue, and pink cubes. The actions that will give you those cubes are these three. 
you have the politician's action, the nobleman action, and the abbess's action. There are also the scribe cubes, but they're not worth votes. You have to check in the round being played which cubes are available. These cubes right here are everything that all players have during this round. In this example, in the first round, players can't even do the politician's action, which gives you brown cubes, nor the scribe's action, which gives you turquoise cubes. Now I'll just point out the other actions that give points. As I mentioned previously, I would personally play the whole game without the PayPal library action. And during the first round or first two rounds, without the messenger, orient and rest actions, and also without any free actions. Feel free to follow this tip if there are people who are new to the game. But fear not, I will explain everything in this video. We have the riddle from Verona track, the Canticle of the Sun track, and the Manuscript action. Now that we have in mind where to get points, let me explain the flow of the game, what you do during your go. You're gonna take all of the five action discs, the big purple ones, and you're gonna place them on these spots. As soon as you use all of the discs, pick them up and pass them to the next player on the order track. Let's talk in detail about the manuscript action. It is used to take the manuscripts from their board. The first thing that will interest you is the number on the manuscripts. That represents their complexity level, and that's how many points you get. For example, a level 4 manuscript will give you 4 points, a level 2 will give you 2, and so on. The other way manuscript score is, if you have all of the 5 colors, you get an extra 5 points. You can only get that bonus once, so let's say you finish the game with two manuscripts of each color, it doesn't matter, you still get five points. To take a manuscript, there are three conditions. First, do you have enough action discs left? You need to look at this number to the left to know how many actions it costs to grab a manuscript from that row. In the beginning of the game, there is a match between the cost and the level, but this can change during the game, so always look at the number on the left. The second condition is your knowledge level. Players start with one knowledge point. It's the only track in the game in which you don't start out of the track with zero. One knowledge point is equivalent to level one of knowledge, so every player can take a level one manuscript right from the beginning. But to take a level two manuscript, you need level two of knowledge. And level two is reached when you have at least 17 knowledge points. Being at level 2, you can take a level 2 or less manuscript. Players are not limited by the board to acquire knowledge. It's possible to go to infinity and beyond. The final thing you have to check is the color of the city where you are. To take a level 2 manuscript this round, in addition to having two action points and at least level 2 of knowledge, my character needs to be in a blue or pink city. Level 4 manuscripts have two colors. This means they can be taken in either of those cities. However, for the bonus for having all colors, these manuscripts only count for one color, and you choose in the end which one. Manuscripts are tiles, so they go behind the shield. On to the riddle from Verona. The track represents the search for this short yet important text. Only one player can score from it. That will be the player that moved furthest on the track. You can spend one to five actions, and the number of actions spent is the number you will advance. Everyone starts out of the track. If black player spends one action and is fulfilling another condition that I'll mention in a second, they take a disc of their color and would enter the track in the first position. The number of points scored depends on the circle that the player reached or passed. If the furthest player ended from the first to the third circle, he or she gets four points. From here to the second to last circle, that would be five. And if the furthest player is in the last circle, they get six points. What happens if more than one player is in the same position on any track? In this game, there is always a tiebreaker. In this case, black player is at the bottom of the pile. That means that they got there earlier, and that makes a difference. A player further down is considered more advanced on every track. In this scenario here, only black player would get points, and those would be five. To advance in the riddle, aside from having actions, you have to be in a blue city. 
Let's talk about the Canticle of the Sun. This is a song written in a dialect by St. Francis of Assisi. Here, two players can discover this text and score. The one furthest on the track gets nine points, and the second one gets six. You only have the right to score if you entered the track. If only red entered the track, black can't be considered second place because he or she didn't join the competition. You can also spend from one to five actions, but you also have to discard one pink cube for each action that you decide to spend. And there's another condition. You need to be in a Franciscan city active in that round. The numbers on the five Franciscan cities represent the round in which that city will be active. And it's only during that round, not starting from that round. From the 14th round on, you can see a picture of St. Francis. Starting at round 14, the five cities become active permanently. You still have to be in one of them, but it doesn't matter which one. You will be able to advance in the canticle track. Heads up, maybe there won't even be a 14th round. A game can last from 13 to 16 rounds. Moving on, actions that provide cubes and how to discard cubes correctly. For all cube types, you can spend one or four action points. One if you want one cube, four if you want two cubes. Remember to check if the cube you want is available. Politicians have an additional cost, 30 Ducati to take one, 60 to take two, in addition to the four actions if you wanted two cubes. The brown cubes are worth three votes, that's their biggest importance. And to become a cardinal, you need to discard either a brown cube or a blue cube. Noblemen, they are worth two votes. Another function they have is that you can discard them immediately to get money. It's 20 Ducati per noble cube. That's twice as the small business action, if you want an easy way to remember, you're welcome. If you take two cubes at once, you can choose to keep both behind your shield, discard both, getting 40 Ducati in total, or even to keep one and discard the other. Let's talk about abysses, the pink cubes. They have an additional cost to the action points. 15 Ducati for one cube, 30 for two. If your character is in an abbey, which is this building on a rock, there are three on the board, you can take abysses without using money. A pink cube has a triple function. It's worth one vote. One needs to be used in the end of the messenger track. I'll explain that later, but that's one of those actions I would start the game without. And the last function is something you already know if you were paying attention. It's the canticle track. You need to discard cubes for the election in the end. If you still have cubes left, you have the chance to get three points if you are the player with the most remaining votes. Finally, the scribes. Upon taking scribe cubes, they are placed in front of your shield. Cubes there are worth absolutely nothing, even in the end of the game. If my character is in an abbey, I have a free action, that is, an action that doesn't require purple discs, which lets me convert all my scribe cubes into either victory points or knowledge. It needs to be all of them. I can't choose a number. What I'm not forced to do is to perform that action if I stop at an abbey. To convert them into victory points, place them behind the shield. They're worth one point each. If I want knowledge, I discard the cubes and get three knowledge points for each. Let me teach you how to discard cubes. The most important thing is that you always discard on the space from a future round, never the one you're currently playing. You have to discard in the first available spot. If I had one space here, this is where a cube would go. I'm out of room here now because I have a limit of four cubes in my two-player game. So I keep occupying the next space. But always check the leftmost space you have. Next up, some actions that are not worth points directly, starting with the small business. It's very simple. You can be anywhere on the map, you spend exactly one action disc, and you get 10 Ducati, even if you're a member of the clergy. Next to that, we have the Psalter action. The Psalter was a book of psalms commonly used for learning to read, thank you Wikipedia. What I get with this action is three knowledge points, or four if I'm the last one in the knowledge track. Let's talk about movement. If I want to move only one space on land, I just spend one action disc and nothing else. But if I want to move more than one space, I have to pay 10 Ducati. I don't pay for each additional disc. It's 10 if my movement required more than one disc. 
it's possible to move between harbors of the same sea. The cities with harbors are those with the anchor symbol. Sea movement requires three discs. I'm spending more than one, so I also need to pay 10 Ducati. I could move from here to here because they are cities with harbors in the same sea. You can even combine the two types of movement during the same go. I could make one movement to here, then I could move by sea. I could go all the way up there, spending three more. And from here, I could keep moving and move one more. So I would spend five actions in total. You cannot interrupt your movement. You can't stop along the way to perform any action, including free ones. And there's a reason for that. You can't do any action more than once on your go. At this time, I would invite players to start the game and play one or two rounds, only using the actions I taught so far. Feel free to explain more things to your group. Let's keep going. I'll start with the two free actions related to cities, the event action. Every round, including the first one, an event tile is taken and placed near a city. That event will stay there until the end of the game if no one claims it. To claim an event, I just gotta be in the city without having claimed an event in that same go. Just like board actions, we are limited to one free action per type during the same go. But remember that they're free, so no action discs are used. An event gives you a knowledge bonus, or an economic bonus, like the one from Venice, or it can give you both, like number 11 here. In this case, I would advance immediately eight spaces on the knowledge track, and I would flip the tile. Palermo is the only city that has two events associated to it. If no one claims them, and both are there at the same time, a player can claim both with a single event action. Event 10, Stupor Mundi, is a special event. Personally, I'd only teach it when round 10 were closer, but I'll teach you right now. And you may teach it at the beginning of the game if you'd like. When round 10 comes, put it in the corresponding city. As other events, it stays there and can be activated in whichever round a player decides. But different from every other event, it can't be activated followed by a movement from the player. The player needs to end their go in the event city. As usual, no events could have been claimed previously in that go. Nothing happens right at the time the event is activated. At the end of the entire round in which the event was activated, the player in the city asks other players a question in player order. The rule book is not clear in relation to that order. Let me put a coin here and let's pretend there's a third player. Say the red player was the one who activated the event. Only one player can. I don't know if the first player to be asked is the player following red or if we go from the start. The way I play is going from the start. The fact is that the player will ask the others if they want to take part in the event. If a player refuses, that player doesn't do anything. But let's suppose Black accepted to participate. Their character is teleported to the event city. Pro tip, maybe you want to accept simply due to the movement. Maybe being in that region of the map is strategic to you. What happens next is an auction. An auction of the 10 knowledge points in the event tile. The currency used in this auction is votes, the same resource used during the election. The player that activated the event gets two virtual votes. He or she may bid using those votes without having to discard cubes for them. And it's even possible to bid only those two votes. That player is the one who starts bidding, followed by the other players in order. Players bid or pass until there's one player left. You can't bid if you're not actually willing to discard the bid cubes. Losers don't discard anything. The winning player discards the bid cubes and gets the knowledge points. At that moment, the tile is flipped. Characters remain where they were. If nobody accepts the invitation, the player automatically gets the points without discarding anything. After the auction, a player might discard more than one cube color. I'll show you how discarding works in this case. The same logic is followed. Discard in the first available future spot, but there is an order 
discard. It's the order we see here. First politicians, then noblemen, and so on. Say I won the auction with this bid of 9 votes. I would have to discard all of these cubes. And it goes like this. First, I discard the politician. I had room here. I would keep discarding here, but now I have no room anymore. Then the nobleman. Then the abbesses. I can only discard three of them here, so the one left is placed in the following round's space. A second important free action is city bonuses. Some cities have this circle, and they have money, knowledge, or both. Before or after your movement, you may take a disc of your color and place it on the city. You will immediately get what is shown. Different players may obtain the same city bonus. Remember that during your go, you may only get one city bonus. If I'm in a city that has an event and that doesn't have one of my discs yet, during my go, I may perform both free actions in it. It's important to first learn the city bonus free action in order to understand the next two board actions. Starting with the messenger. It's similar to other tracks. You place discs to progress. The difference is that being in a specific region is not required. Your goal here is to reach the last space. This red circle is a space. Therefore, you need a total of eight actions throughout the game. If you don't reach the final circle, you don't get anything with this track. There's also this cost. I know it's on the second to last circle, but this is the cost to move from here to here. You still need to pay one pink cube and 10 Ducati. By reaching the final circle, you were accepted at the University of Bologna. To study at the university, you need to do the free action of leaving your disc there. You can do that if you didn't leave a disc on the same go. That city bonus is only available for players who completed the track. However, the event of Bologna may be taken by any player who stopped there. You will get 15 knowledge points if you leave your disc from the 1st to the 7th round, or 10 if you leave your disc from the 8th round on. Let me just emphasize, it's the round you leave your disc in the city, not the round you were accepted. Studying at the university has a second perk, that the board, as well as the shield, remind us. You get one point for each city that you visited that gave you knowledge. Only in the end do we count every disc in cities that gave knowledge. For instance, Venice isn't a city we would consider as it only gives money. Rome gives both money and knowledge, so it counts. We also include Bologna itself. Remember, you only have the right to those victory points if you were able to visit Bologna. Let me talk about the Orient action. Pretty similar to the messenger, your goal is to get to the red circle and you could be anywhere on the map. When you reach the end, first of all, this represents that you're an awesome merchant, congrats, and you immediately get 10 Ducati for each each city that you already visited that gave you money. Also, a player who completes the Orient track gets in the end one point for each harbor city visited. I'm gonna repeat this when I explain friars and cardinals, but if you're a clergy member, you can't even advance in the Orient track, and you can only get the points if you remained a merchant. We're almost done, don't give up. Now the papal library, right here. The one I like removing if there are people playing the game for the first time. You don't have to use it immediately, even because you could keep progressing, but as soon as you reach a number, you unlocked a free action. The action to look at a certain number of tiles and keep one, regardless of how many you look. These papal books contain victory points from 2 to 4. The number you look is the number you reached. If I reached number two, I could look at the first two in secret. Then the chosen one goes behind the shield. All the others go to the bottom of the pile. I have to remove entirely my disc from the track. I may advance again and draw more from the library later, but there's a limit to how many tiles you can keep. It's your knowledge level. Let's suppose I had these two here and my level were two. I could draw a new one and discard this old one. In secret, it would go to the bottom of the pile. The other benefit is this symbol right here. It is used as a wild card for a manuscript of any color. Comes in handy for that sweet five point bonus. Rest action now. At the beginning of a new round, the last thing you do before the action phase is to define the new player order. That order is the reverse order of the knowledge track. From round one to round two, if no one acquires knowledge, the player picked to be first will continue to be first as his or her disc is placed on top. 
Well, what is the rest action used for? The player furthest on the track will be the first player of the next round. Only for the other players is knowledge checked. You remain here throughout the game. You just can't go beyond the fifth space. So we see who's furthest. Let me give you another example so we can remember a rule. Black player is still ahead. That disc is removed. It returns to the player's stock and that player will necessarily be the first. The other discs stay where they were. And finally, the last two actions, which are free actions. To become a friar, you have to be at a convent. It's this square building and you have to give the bank half of your money Round it up to the next multiple of 5, as coins start at 5. If you have zero Ducati, you may become friar without paying. Replace your merchant meeple by your friar meeple. Also, select one of the friar tiles. Each one has a different power. At this point, you would also discard your merchant tile if you were stubborn and decided to play with those. It's also possible to become cardinal. To do so, you gotta be a friar and you have to stop at a cathedral. There are only two. You need to pay 40 Ducati or 70 if you want to become Cardinal Murray, who has a better power. Additionally, you have to pay either a brown cube or a blue cube. Replace your Friar Meeple by your Cardinal Meeple, remove your Friar tile from the game, and choose your favorite Cardinal. When you're a Friar or Cardinal, you can't do Orient anymore, and you can't get money from city bonuses nor events. If it's a city or an event that only has money, you can't leave your disc or flip that tile. If it's a city or event that also has knowledge, the rule book is not totally clear, but my interpretation is that you can acquire those knowledge points. For example, this cardinal wouldn't get the money here, only the seven knowledge. A friar or cardinal can keep doing small business, as well as discarding blue cubes immediately to get money from them. Some friars and cardinals have a cube drawn on them. That's a virtual cube, so you never lose it. You may use it only once per action, but you may use it many times on the same go, including stupor mundi, the election, and the chance to get three points for most remaining votes. This friar has a virtual blue cube. It can't be used for money. If you are this friar, you get an extra five Ducati during every charity phase from whoever pays you. And if you end the game as him, you lose four points. With this friar, you immediately gain seven knowledge, permanently don't pay to move, and brilliantly get four victory points if you remain as him. This cardinal doesn't lose knowledge. What happens is that you get a free action that you can only use once in the whole game, which is selecting any player to lose six knowledge. That player won't lose any manuscripts they already have. And in the end, you get four VPs. If you become this cardinal, you immediately get 40 Ducati. You may also look at one extra tile when you do the Papal Library free action. You still have to keep only one. Lastly, the powerful Cardinal Murray. You get one extra action disc, so you'll do six actions in every go. You're still limited to what is shown on the board for each action, though. It's impossible to go back to being a friar or a merchant. Phew, that's all the actions. Let's see what happens at the beginning of a new round. The player aid is really useful for this. So, this is what you do after every player's actions. First, events. You would take the marker if you're using it and would put it on the next space, placing the event in its corresponding city. Say we have finished round two and we're going to round three. I like flipping these, so it's easier to see that that city won't be active and so that players can focus on the other cities. Optional step for you. After events, the cubes. Take every cube from the round you just played and discard them exactly the way I already showed you. Let's suppose I'm about to start round 11. I would have to discard every cube from round 10 in the next available spots. If I run out of round spaces, I could remove the cubes from the board or just keep them where they were, doesn't matter. Nothing special is done when the board is over. Next step, manuscripts. Remember, don't do any of these things while a round is being played. 
check if you need to refill any spaces so that you will have on the board the number of manuscripts per round depending on the number of players. Then check if any row is completely depleted, including its pile. If that's the case, every manuscript will move up. Consequently, they will become cheaper in actions. And that's how the level 8 manuscript enters the game, initially with a 4 action cost. The level 8 manuscript is colorless. It can be taken from anywhere, including places without colors, such as starting cities or abbeys. Moving on with charity. Following player order, check one player at a time. Check if he or she is a clergy member. Then, find out who the richest merchant is. If more than one merchant is the richest, the clergy player that we're checking chooses from those. The last thing to do is to verify if that wealthy merchant is richer than the clergy player. If these criteria are met, charity happens from the merchant to the clergy member. The merchant pays 5 if the clergy player is a friar or 10 if he or she is a cardinal. If there is no richer merchant or if every player belongs to the clergy, charity to the player we're checking comes from the bank. The amount paid is the same. I emphasized a lot the fact that you check one player at a time because the richest merchant is the richest one at that instant. The rule book has an interesting example of how the richest merchant may change as players pay charity, so you may want to check that out if you're confused. From the 12th round on, which is when papal events start, the charity step doesn't happen anymore. The final step before actions is player order, and I already explained that. Check if there is anyone on the rest track, and the others will be placed in reverse order of the knowledge track. The round in which the second red tile is revealed will be the last round. It is played like any other, the only difference being that all players are moved to Rome in the start of the round. Game over, time to tally points. The shield is the perfect reminder. Start with the election. Once again, players have to discard the cubes to get votes. Don't worry too much about the title. Uh, I saw a question once on BGG saying, if I become banker, do I stop being a merchant? Do I lose the right to score for the Orient, for example? No, you are the meeple that you have. Many players can obtain the same bonus with the exception of the Pope bonus. If more than one cardinal has 17 votes, only the one with the higher knowledge can become pope. Knowledge is a tiebreaker for everything. And don't forget the position of the discs. If a cardinal accumulated 17 votes but can't become pope, he doesn't have to discard them. He can just discard 11 to become Camerlengo. Let's keep following the shield, shall we? The next thing to score is the points marked on the manuscripts. Then, another bonus that every player can get. The five points if you have all the colors. Don't forget to consider the symbols on the papal library tiles and to consider level four manuscripts as a single color they show. Next one, three points for the player that has the most remaining votes. Not simply quantity of cubes, but vote value. Then we have the canticle, which pays out two players. Nine points for the player furthest on the track, six for second place. Then the messenger. Check if players reached the end of the track and left their disc on Bologna. One point for each city with a knowledge bonus, including Bologna. Some cardinals and friars have victory points. If a player became pope, he or she can't get the points from these two cardinals. But a player who became Camerlengo can. Next score is for turquoise cubes behind your shield. One point for each. Next to that, we have the points from the papal library. Then it's points for the player with most money. If that player is a merchant, he or she gets six points. If that player is a friar or a cardinal, it's three points. Riddle from Verona. Only one player scores, and the number of points depends on the space on the track that the player passed. Lastly, the Orient track. Every player who remained a merchant and completed the track gets one point for each harbor with a disc of their color. After tallying the points for those 12 ways of scoring, the player with the most points is the winner. 
as usual, knowledge breaks ties.